You've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession on the world's number one chiropractic podcast. This episode is brought to you by Imaging Services, Cairo Health USA, Cairo Moguls, Chiropractic Rocks, The Goodman Factor, Digital Hustle, True Weight Solutions, The 100 Year Lifestyle, Pure Cairo Notes, Titronics, Ultimate Entrepreneur Opportunity, and Cairo Pro Accounting. Let's hustle. Hey guys, welcome to episode 227 of the Cairo Hustle podcast. I am your co-host, Luke Millette. Here's your host, Jim Chester. So today we had the opportunity of interviewing epigenetic specialist, Bruce Lipton. If you want to know more about the biology of belief, stay tuned. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today we have the honor of having uh, Bruce Lipton on with us today. And this is episode 227 of the Cairo Hustle podcast. And before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I just want to welcome you with a warm welcome from Luke and I to be our guest today. Who, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I, I'm so excited to be your guest. I didn't even know it was me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks, guys. I really want to appreciate it very much because uh we're entering a, a a new world right now and it's very interesting because if you look outside at the world and it looks like in total chaos which it is uh this is a very important sign and people are afraid of the chaos and i'm going don't be afraid of the chaos because without it we are in a real serious problem because civilization is facing what is called the six mass extinction of life uh five times in the history of the planet life was thriving and some event wiped out up to 90 percent of life and it started all over again the the last mass extinction uh 66 million years ago is when the dinosaurs were here uh and a comet hit near mexico upended the ecosystem not only losing the dinosaurs but almost all of life and it started all over again and here we are today uh, and, and today, uh, science has actually recognized, not today, <laughs> recognized 15 years ago that civilization has so negatively impacted the environment that we are causing our own extinction. I mean, just to uh, give you guys a, a story, like, um, I don't know if you were born in 1970, but... Uh, <laughs> 78. <laughs> what's that? 1978. Okay. Well, before you were born, <laughs> the World Wildlife Foundation took a survey of how many animals are on this planet. And uh, then what they did uh, was just a couple of years ago, repeated that survey. And fact, two thirds of the entire animal population of planet Earth has disappeared since 1970. There's only one third the number of animals left. Another fact that be prepared that We've overfished the oceans, we polluted the water and disturbed breeding grounds to the extent there will be no fish in the ocean 2048. That's conservative estimate. And I say, well, why? We did that. <laughs> We're destroying it. And uh, and NASA carried out a survey that said industrial civilization, the one we're in, uh, is facing an irreversible collapse. Irreversible meaning it's going to collapse and it's not, you can't save it. You can't go back and save this. And the reason why is the way we've been living is causing the problem. <laughs> and so this is nature's wake up call. We have chaos, economic, social, political, religious, racial, the whole damn thing is shaking up. And the reason is this, we have to rebuild a different way to live on this planet where we learn to live in harmony with nature rather than the belief that we can dominate and control nature, which is fundamental in the world of science. That's what we're doing. It's like, how's that working out? And I go, it's not working out that good. <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> and COVID is a, another story associated with this. And COVID uh, is really... I'm not going to, I can't stick with the conventional story too much. I teach immunology, so I have a, a bit of an insight into what the nature of all this is. And I'll just tell you, the seriousness of the COVID virus is not because of uh, the virus is that virulent. It's because people are that weak. That's the problem. Uh, and that 40% uh, of Americans have 27 uh, chronic illnesses. So over two, 40% of Americans, over two chronic illnesses. And I say, why is that relevant? 
a chronic illness taxes the immune system. And I go, so why is that wrong? I say, well, all of a sudden you get invaded by a virus. Uh, and I say, well, how's your immune system function? I go, not very really good. I say, well, then the, the, the lower the functioning of that immune system, the more severe the COVID case is. That's basically what it comes down to. And that's why 80, 90% of the people that have COVID didn't have enough of symptoms to go see a doctor or go to the hospital or anything because they're okay. I, I had it myself. <laughs> and I said, so what? Yeah, I had a flu. It lasted a, a few more days than I thought. But the reality is what? I now have antibodies. <laughs> I, I'm resistant to the flu. You hide people away and say, okay, put them in quarantine. I go, and what's the consequence of that? And I say, the day you let them out of quarantine, you start the whole damn thing all over again because nobody gained immunity in, 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 in quarantine. The virus didn't go away while they're in quarantine. You just offset the, you know, the, the bigger impact of a pandemic. And why is it relevant? The answer is because in this new virus version, we have had coronaviruses for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and we even have immunity to most coronaviruses. What's different about the COVID coronavirus is that it hasn't been in our world of human population before. So that means almost everybody is going to get it to some degree. Now, how much immunological memory you have from the previous exposure will also determine uh, the influence of the current uh, infection with that virus. If you have a good memory, uh, you have a, a resistance already. And that's why a lot of people uh, didn't even know they had the virus, okay? Uh, but what's most important is simply this, is that the best way to manage the virus is to get the infection with a healthy immune system. Uh, and I have to tell you, I'm, I'm not pro-vaccine at all for a very important reason. Now, I'm doing this from a biological thing. It has nothing other than I'm a biologist, okay? And I'm going to tell you this. There's a complete misunderstanding in the world about what are tonsils, those things in your throat. If you look in the books, most people say, oh, tonsils are there to protect you from stuff that comes in your mouth, your nose, through your eyes or ears, the openings. Uh, if infective stuff gets in there, they say the tonsils are there to fight and protect you. I go, completely false. The whole meaning of a tonsil, that's completely false. A tonsil is a learning center for the immune system. It's not designed to make combat with stuff. It's designed to understand, make a memory, and then create an immune response. So it doesn't actually do physical protection. In fact, tonsils are open to the outside. There are channels connected to the, to the uh, lining of the throat, uh, uh, channels that open up. I say, where do they go? They go into the tonsil. I go, well, if you're trying to ward off an infection, why would you put a channel in there to open it up to the infection? The answer is, that's how it samples what's going on in your world. And those that have kids also know this. A baby instinctively will put everything in its world into its mouth. Anything in that crib, whether it's the dirty diaper, the hand, the foot, whatever. And I go, instinct, why? Because this is how the learning system, the immune system works. It's creating antibodies against those things. And I go, oh, so that's that's where the learning occurs. I go, yes, the tonsils are learning. I say, what if you take a needle and inject some crap under your skin into the muscle? I go, you bypass the intelligence of one of the most intelligent existing organisms in the universe as far as we know. You bypass the intelligence of the system. You, It's sort of like uh, uh, you're walking down the street and all of a sudden, boom, a pile of crap just came out of the sky and go, where the hell did that come from? Uh, and the reality is, if you bypass the system, you're not supporting the system, number one. Number two, a child's immune system isn't really mature enough until about age three. So when you start overburdening a child with a vaccine that came in illegally <laughs> because there were no centuries to observe that, okay, uh, I say, what is the consequence of that? And I go, you have violated an intelligent system. You're not supporting the immune system by doing that. I'm not saying don't vaccinate. I'm saying vaccinate with what? 
oral vaccines. Why? They're the ones that are read by the immune system's intelligence. And so a vaccine injected bypasses intelligence. A vaccine taken down through the throat is engaging the immune system. Well, that's fascinating. You know, I I, I, I like the uh, I the strategy that you bring to this conversation today, talking about immunology and bridging that with biology, and talking <laughs> about why our species is um, on a one way passage to uh, extinction. And as I listen to the, the the message that you share with our audience today, I can't help but bring it back to the vitalistic approach of chiropractic and why it's important to let the body heal from inside out. And when you're talking about these tonsils and these adenoids and how the body actually builds up a defense mechanism towards sickness and disease and infirmary, I think that when we're talking about the bigger idea of chiropractic, um, there was a, a real reason why you got into this healing art um, yeah. when you did and you started to work with Life West and Palmer and then went over to New Zealand. So maybe you could just share with us a little bit about how you actually started to take your biology mind and bring it into the healing art of chiropractic. Okay. Well, let's, uh, here's the, the, the story of how it unfolded. I used to be a professor in a medical school. Uh, University of Wisconsin School of Medicine, teaching uh, cell biology, histology, some embryology uh, to medical students, okay, with a curriculum that was predetermined before I got there. And that curriculum and dealt with the fact that genes control life, okay? Uh, and I say, what is the consequence of that curriculum? Let's just bring that right up because this is really critical. If you took that natural curriculum, that genes control life, then what you have done is disempowered the public. I go, what do you mean? I go, well, the fact is this, knowledge is power. A lack of knowledge is a lack of power. When you program people to believe that genes turn on and off and control your biology and your life, you are disempowering people for a couple of reasons. Number one, as far as we know, you didn't pick the genes you came with. If you don't like the genes of the characters you got, you can't change those genes. And then in school, we're teaching, hey, those genes turn on and off by themselves, independent of you. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, we're teaching victimization. You're a victim of your heredity. Oh, my God, there's cancer running in my family. Oh, my God. Alzheimer's in my family. I go, you know, and, and I say, well, what's the problem with that? Because there's a perception now that I'm a victim. I go, so what? I say, what biology was I doing back 50 three years ago, that's older than you guys, uh, 53 years ago, I was cloning stem cells. 53 years ago, there weren't more than a handful of people in the entire world that even knew what the hell a stem cell was. And I not only was working with them, I was cloning them. And my research, you put one cell in a dish by itself, it divides every 10 hours. After a week, I got 30,000 cells in the dish. It's called cloning. I say, what does it represent? It says, all 30,000 cells are genetically identical copies of the original cell. So they're all genetically identical. Okay. That's the start of the experiment. I said, but what is the experiment? I say, I create growth medium to grow the cells in. I said, what is growth medium? I say, that's a laboratory version of blood. If I grow human cells, I say, what is human blood made out of? And then I make those compositions and put it in a dish and then put the cells in it and they feel at home. If I grow mouse cells, I say, what's mouse blood made out of? Make a medium for that and the mouse cells feel happy. So I go, so what? So I make the equivalent of blood, culture medium. But in my research, I changed some of the, some of the composition a little bit. So I made three different versions of culture medium, basically the same with slight chemical difference between all three. Now, here's the experiment, and my whole world went upside down, and I, I actually had to leave the university as a result of the insight offered, and that is what? I now take the dish with 30,000 genetically identical cells. I put it into three different Petri dishes, and I fed each Petri dish a slightly different version of culture medium, which is environment. <laughs> That's what the cells live in. So I had three environments, genetically identical cells in all three, but in one dish, the cells form muscle. Another dish, the cells form bone. A third dish, they form fat cells. I go, wait, they were all genetically identical. What made them become this, this, or this? I go, environment. 
I go, and especially culture medium environment, which is the equivalent of blood. Now you go, so what does that mean? I say, the genes did not control the expression of the cells. The environment controlled the expression of the cells. And I go, whoa, this is completely different. I say, why? Because I can control the environment. And if I can control the environment, then by definition, I can control my genes. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, we're not victims of our genetics. We are creators of our genetics. And I go, well, how does it work? And I go, hey, that Petri dish, plastic dish, cells in it, culture medium, equivalent of blood. And I go, a human is a skin-covered Petri dish because underneath our skin, 50 trillion cells. I go, oh, do they have growth medium? I go, the original growth medium, blood. I go, oh, so that the blood circulating through my body is controlling the genetics of my cells. I go, yes. What's in that blood? Well, nutrition, but that's that's basic for everything. But cellular signals, what are cellular signals? Growth hormones, emotional chemicals, all these different kinds of stress hormones. I go, these are chemicals. Where do they come from? The nervous system. I go, so why is it relevant? Because if there's an impedance on the nervous system, then the chemical information in that blood changes. Oh, yeah, but what happens if the chemical information in the blood changes? The growth medium? It changes the genetics of the cells. And you go, oh, wait a minute. My nervous system is reading the environment and adjusting my cells to respond to that environment. So epigenetics, the new science, which is what my research was, you know, pioneer research in epigenetics, because epigenetics is, let, let me define it for the audience, really important because it's a revolution, total revolution. I go, this character is under genetic control. Genetic control means control by genes. So that's what we believed. What do we say? Huh, our life is controlled by genes. That's what we say. Epigenetics changes because epi means above. What, what, what do they call skin? Epidermis. I say, what does that mean? It's a layer above the underneath layer is called dermis. Epidermis means above the dermis. Now I say, this character is under epigenetic control. What does that mean? Epi means above. So epigenetic control translates as control above the genes. The control is not in the genes. I never was. We believed it, but it's false. Why? A gene is a blueprint. Go into an architect's office, and she's working on a blueprint. And you lean over her shoulder, and you go, is your blueprint on or off? And she look at you, wait, you're crazy. It's a blueprint. There's no on and off. And I go, precisely. A gene is a blueprint. It has no ability to turn itself on and off. It can be read or not read. But the gene does never, never determines that reading. It's the nervous system. Epigenetics and conventional science is, oh, oh, yes, environment controls genetic expression, like I did in the culture dish, right? And they always say environment controls and environment controls. And I go, yeah, that's true. But medicine hasn't taken the most important, important step. And that is what? My cells in my body respond to the environment, but not to the real environment. My cells, my liver cell doesn't know what the hell's going on out here. I say, how does my liver cell respond to the environment? I say, because my nervous system is reading the environment and sending signals about what's going on in that environment via the blood, via the nervous system, then via the blood to my cells. So I say, my cells do not read the real environment. They read my interpretation of that environment through my nervous system. I go, yeah, because the nervous system is reading the environment, puts an interpretation, good environment, scary environment, healthy environment, whatever. That's an interpretation. I say, then what? I say, then the brain releases chemistry through the nervous system that complements that interpretation. Is it a happy environment? I release happy chemicals. A scary environment? I release stress chemicals. I go, oh, so how you see the environment, it changes your biology. Fact, all my wonderful Kairos out here, give you this most important fact. I'm going to give it to you. It's going to come into your conscious mind, and you're going to go, okay, 
I got that fact. And I'm going to say, the problem is to make that fact work, it has to go from your conscious mind into your subconscious program. And this is why our conscious minds generally are so smart, but our lives don't match the smartness of that. I go, why not? Because we're not running our life with our conscious mind. Only 5% of the day is conscious mind in charge of your biology, your chemistry, your nervous system. And conscious mind is the wishes and desires. Yeah, I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to have a great thing. I go, 5% of the day is when that conscious mind is running. I go, then what? I say 95% of the day, your biology and behavior is controlled by your programs and the subconscious mind. I go, why? Give a simple explanation. Consciousness, when it's driving the vehicle, the body, let's say there's a steering wheel, it's driving me to what? Consciousness is creative. It drives you to wishes and desires. I want to go to Cairo school. I want to have a great relationship. I want to have a great practice. I go, consciousness. But consciousness can think. I say, so what does that mean? I go, well, if you're driving, you're looking out the world and you're driving into this world. But I say, thinking is not looking out. Thinking is looking in. A thought is on the inside. So, hey, Luke, while you're sitting there right now, I got to say, hey, uh, tell me what you're doing on Monday. And you go, well, it's not written in front of you. I go, no, no, you can think about it. I bet you can come up with an answer. But that answer is not out here. The answer is in here. The point, when you are thinking, you redirect the focus of the conscious mind to inside processing. You let go of the control of outside processing. I say outside processing, well, hey, what if you're driving a car and you're thinking, does that mean the whole thing goes to hell? I go, no. Subconscious is autopilot. Whenever consciousness is not paying attention, subconscious autopilot steps in. And we'll take care of the vehicle. And I go, so what does that mean? I say, it's subconscious. It's an autopilot. You don't see that behavior when it's playing. I say, why not? Because your conscious mind is not looking out the window. It's looking inside. <laughs> and I say, so what the behavior is coming out? You don't see it. I go, well, is it good behavior or bad behavior? I go, what was your program in that first seven years of life where we get programmed? Did you get programmed with empowerment or did you get programmed by who do you think you are? You're not that smart. You're not that whatever. You're not this. You're not that. Those are programs. If you run a life from those negative programs and you have a negative life experience. And so the reality becomes very important. Are you creating your life? Answer is yes. But are you creating with a conscious mind, which is wishes and desires? Or are you creating your life with your subconscious mind, which is just programs? Okay. And the answer is, unfortunately, 95% of the life comes from programs. So I've been I, I've given the same story 30 years in my lecture. I'm going to say it again. Why? Because I haven't found a better one. But when it comes up, I will make a new one. But right now, here's the old 30-year-old story. It goes like this. You have a friend. You know your friend's behavior very well. And you happen to know your friend's parent. One day, you see your friend has the exact same behavior as their parent. This excites you. I can't wait. Hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. Back away from Bill. The first thing Bill's going to do is, how the hell can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. Everyone laughs because there's a personal experience with that. And I go, what does it represent? Everyone can see Bill's behavior except for Bill. Why? Why can't Bill see it? And why is he playing this behavior? Because 95% of the day, Bill is thinking. And now he's going to play the behavior program he downloaded by observing his father and his mother. I go, are these programs good? Well, up to 70% of the downloaded programs are disempowering. So right away, there's a problem. And I go, so why is it relevant? Well, why is he playing these programs? He's thinking. Does he see the behavior that's coming out? Nope, because he's thinking. Does everybody else see the behavior and respond to that? Yes, they do. Then I go, conclusion? We are all Bill. Every one of us every day are playing programs that most of which when downloaded from our parents and our family and community were very disempowering programs. I'll give you one we just talked about. Program. Your life is not under your control. It's under the control of genes. Oh, you have a cancer gene. Oh, you're going to get cancer. 
I go, that's a program. I go, why? Because first of all, here's a, a little sidelight. There is no such thing as a cancer gene. There's not one gene that causes cancer. There are genes correlated with cancer, but they didn't cause it. I'll give you an example. Women are so, you know, rightfully <laughs> nervous about the fact they might have the breast cancer gene, BRCA1 or 2. And they go, wow, my God, I just got diagnosed. I got this breast cancer. <gasps> I could get breast cancer here. And that is, a, unfortunately, a very negative psychology with negative chemistry that comes out. Okay. But I say this, wait a minute. Only 50% of the women that carry that gene ever get a cancer. I say, what does that mean? Fundamental. Possession of the gene does not cause cancer. Living out of harmony will activate an oncogene, but the oncogene itself did not activate. So the idea that genes cause uh, cancer, uh, that's a phony statement. That's not even real. Genes can't turn on and off and cause cancer unless you turn them on and off. And all of a sudden, oh, uh-oh, personal responsibility. Jeez, that's a bitch to teach people. <laughs> you are creating this, uh, and, but you're not creating it with your wishes and desires, conscious mind, you're creating it with your program. So for example, they looked at what the fate of the child was if it was adopted into a family where there was cancer running in that family. And they found that the adopted baby will grow up and get the same family cancer as any of the natural siblings. I go, wait, the adopted baby has totally different genetics. Didn't even come from that family. So what the hell was making the cancer? And the answer was that first seven years of programming, if it's not in harmony and not supporting you and disempowering you, makes you a victim. I go, you mean the first seven years controls our life? Secret. For 400 years, the Jesuits have told their followers, give me a child for the first seven years and I will show you the man. People didn't understand what the hell they were saying. What were they saying? If I make your programs for the first seven years, 95% of your life is going to be those programs. And all of a sudden I go, you mean for 400 years people knew they could control your life with their program? I go, yeah. You think that disappeared? I say, no, they're programming people better today. If you've ever seen an infant who could hardly walk carrying around an iPad, you will see what I'm talking about. Programming is going in. So I go, so why is all this relevant? Well, programming is the work of the nervous system. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, now what? Well, if I interfere with that nervous system, I say, how? Trauma? Yeah, I fall off the curb, wrench my spine. Guess what? I've interfered with the flow, the information that was coordinating my biology. Okay, that's a problem. Okay. Uh, toxins. Yeah. If you put toxins in the system, you're going to interfere with the signal that's being energetically carried by these chemicals. Okay. And the most powerful influence is thought. And I go, wait a minute. That's D.D. Palmer. 1895, the cause of subluxation is due to Thoughts. three T's, three T's, trauma, toxin, thought, 100% right, 100% right, 1895, 100% right. And I go, so why is it relevant? Because while chiropractors, especially mechanical chiropractors, try to directly deal with pushing the things around like it's a physical machine and that if they move these things around, uh, they're going to fix something. I go, no, nope. <laughs> it's an energy field. You have to adjust the energy field. Now, vitalistic chiropractors, without even knowing that they're doing this, are what? Hands-on healing. This was the healing that occurred thousands of years before medical school ever showed up. Hands-on healing was the way that people got healed. I said, how does that do it? And I go, it's not the hands. It's the energy from the mind that is being broadcast. And so when a chiropractor is doing an adjustment, it's the consciousness of the chiropractic that's doing the healing. I go, so why is that relevant? So uh, if we have a number of chiropractors out there that have been practicing for a while, they'll know one thing. You can have a wonderful day every day when you go in and, and you adjust people. And then all of a sudden, there's one day where it doesn't work for crap. 
It's like, oh my God, a whole bunch of bad adjustments. I don't know what the hell happened. I what I forget how to adjust? No. If you didn't go in with harmony on your side, then your energy field is not going to boost the energy field of the patient or whatever you want to call them. Okay. I go, why is it relevant? Why do they come to you? Because their energy fields are altered. And that energy alteration is altering their biology because biology is controlled by this energy field. And I say, so why would they come to a chiropractor? And the answer is this. Well, everyone focuses that I did the adjustment, this adjustment, that adjustment, toggle, whatever the hell you want to go to. Was it the physical adjustment? And I go, no. <laughs> it was your energy and you touching them, hands on healing. If you go into the office and your energy is not up, <laughs> then when you touch people, you may not be helping them at all. And that's the difference when people go in. I mean, they could be very successful every day. And then all of a sudden, one day out of the blue, it's just like, oh, didn't even work. I go, where were you that day? Not where were the patient? Where were you that day? And so this gives some very important, necessary insight to chiropractors. There's an old, old phrase that works in here. Physician, heal thyself. What? If you're not healthy, how can you imprint healthy into a patient? You're touching them. You're putting your energy in. If you're out of balance, the energy you just put in is not going to be that good for your patient. Okay? So. I've said this for a long time. To, um, What's that? I've said this for a long time to chiropractors, that if you have money problems, your adjustments are going to lack value. If you have uh, relationship problems, then your adjustments are going to suffer the relationship with the enmeshment of the bond with you and the person you're giving care to. So you have to have all aspects in harmony. Um, that's, the body, that's the it. balance in the business. It all has to be in one smooth surface. Otherwise, there's going to be fractions inside of the practice. And that's why chiropractors need to listen to what you're saying about the biology of the environment but the environment's the one inside of it, the, the practitioner as well. So the environment's twofold, the environment inside of that practice, but the, also the environment inside of the practitioner. So that biology the environment's so spot on. Exactly what it's all about, you know? Uh, and it's so interesting. So um, going back to the original question about two days ago, the question was, how did I get there? Uh, uh, and the answer was, well, I was uh, at the University of Wisconsin when I originally did this research. My colleagues dissed my research because they said, it's, hey, jeans, jeans, jeans. Everything was jeans. And I'm going, eh, it's not the jeans. Well, I was the only guy and everybody else was jeans. It, I didn't fit anymore. I had tenure at the medical school. I walked out the door. I said, fine, I'm not going to go in that classroom and teach victimization because the new research is not victimization. It's empowerment. I go, what do you mean? I said, the new research says your thoughts and your environment are controlling your biology. And if you understand that, then you are the one that's controlling your biology, not the genes. Didn't fare very well at University of Wisconsin, but I got picked up at Stanford in California, Stanford Medical School, preeminent of all schools, you know, uh, and they brought me in because I challenged them <laughs> with this belief. But in a very short time, my cell culture research changed the belief of all those people around me that saw this every day and said, wait, this, this, is, this is real. Something's going on here. They saw epigenetics before epigenetics became official, 1990. <laughs> That's when it became official. I was already there 30, 28 years before uh, already doing this stuff. But then I showed them at Stanford. And then I started talking, uh, you know, in a lecture about, hey, this new biology, nervous system, consciousness, all this, controlling genetics. And then I get a call from uh, Life uh, West, uh, Pat Gaiman, who was dean of basic sciences, said, Bruce, why don't you come to chiropractic and give us your lecture? And I go, I don't know nothing about chiropractic. I I'm teaching in a medical school. Not that I had any contact <laughs> with chiropractic, okay? But she said to me, the points that you're talking about are fundamental to chiropractic. I go, okay. So before going, I read the 1895 handbook from D, you know, D.D. Palmer. And I go, oh my God, this guy was into the quantum physics. They didn't have a name for it, but this is all about consciousness, tone, vibration. I go, that's quantum physics. So I thought, 
I'm going to go and give that lecture. I got all excited because I'm going to say, I'm going to connect for you what D.D. Palmer knew. So I start going over the lecture about this. Uh, and then all of a sudden, there's a lot of noise in the classroom. They're all blah, 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 blah. And I go, what's going on? And they go, this is not what we're being taught. I said, what are you being taught? He said, B.J. Palmer. And I, I said, oh, no. <laughs> he was very essential because what he did was take what would have been a spiritual science and gave it a foundation that the public could accept as a physical science. Mm. But you threw out the philosophy. And the philosophy was, this is energy, vibration, and tone. And this is all what it's about. All of that is, by definition, quantum physics. It has nothing to do with physical chemistry at that point. And I started to say, you let go of D.D. Palmer, you let go of the truth of what chiropractic is all about. It's an energy healing system. And it's non-invasive. That is the most important characteristic to it. Keep your hands out of this machine. It is more complicated. The most powerful, intelligent system on the universe, as far as we know, is a human body and a human brain. And that when we think we know how we're going to control that, it's like, oh boy, a little knowledge is a very dangerous thing. And that is why a fact, and I'm not saying this just <laughs> for saying it, I'm saying because a fact in 2001, Barbara Starfield, MD, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, wrote an article and revealed that allopathic conventional medicine is the third leading cause of death in the United States. Cardiovascular disease one, cancer number two, and the Latin name, iatrogenic illness, is number three. Iatrogenic illness is defined as illness as a result of medical treatment. Okay? That was 2001. Guess what? The British Medical Journal, within the last two years, repeated this research. Guess what? Medicine is the third leading cause of death still in the United States. It's not, it's not a suggestion. It's a fact. I go, so why? Because they're operating from Newtonian principles that separate the physical realm from the energetic realm, throw out the energetic realm, and think you can fix everything in here through physical intervention. I go, nope. Nope, you violated the intelligence of the system. The intelligence system is an energy. And so fact, this is a fact. The most valid science on planet Earth is quantum physics. There's no other science that has been tested more and affirmed to be truer than quantum physics. So if you're going to argue with the science, quantum physics would be the last one you should argue with. Okay, And I say, yeah, but what's the most important point? In quantum physics, from day one, it has been recognized that consciousness is creating our life experience. You want to change your life experience? Don't change the physical body. You change consciousness. And I go, what about chiropractic and quantum physics? I go, it is the exemplar of quantum physics. When you realize as a chiropractor, you are changing an energy field. It's a quote from Albert Einstein. You ready? This is a big one. Short quote, big meaning. The field is the soul control of the particle. The field controls matter. That is number one principle in quantum physics. Consciousness is the field generator. And in fact, in an article in Nature not that long ago, Nature, the most prestigious scientific journal on the planet, there was an article by a quantum physicist from Johns Hopkins, Richard Con Henry. The article was entitled The Mental Universe. Now remember, this is this is in Nature. And I say, I will just give you the last sentence of that entire article, not even big article. The last sentence reads, the universe is immaterial. It's mental and spiritual. Live and enjoy. That is the closing sentence in a science article in the most prestigious scientific journal on the planet, Nature. Yep. What did it say? This is an illusion, this physical thing, which if we had many hours, I would go into explain it, which I do in my lectures. But this is an illusion of light, number one. I go, what do you mean? We're made out of energy. Energy is invisible. Well, if energy is invisible, then how can I see you? How can you see me? And I go, it sounds like a joke. And everybody laughs. I go, 
because the lights are on. I go, this is not a joke, though. I say, what do you mean? Light is photons, particles of light, photons. I go, when the light is on, the photons hit the energy field, you, but are deflected back. You've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession on the world's number one chiropractic podcast. This episode is brought to you by Imaging Services, Cairo Health USA, Cairo Moguls, Chiropractic Rocks, The Goodman Factor, Digital Hustle, True Weight Solutions, The 100 Year Lifestyle, Pure Cairo Notes, Titronics, Ultimate Entrepreneur Opportunity, and Cairo Pro Accounting. Let's hustle. You don't see me, you see a veneer of photons. And that's how CAT scans and MRI scans, all those things work. They show you all the body parts. I go, yeah, but it has nothing to do with light. Those scan systems only read energy fields. I go, oh, the structure of your body is read in energy fields. I go, you are energy fields. <laughs> and the relevance about that is that means you must change your consciousness from a Newtonian universe of matter and energy as opposing kinds of things. I go, no, it's a unity. Everything is energy. And quantum physics is all that science. And chiropractic is predicated from 1895 on influencing energy. It was from the very beginning, the most harmonious with the most valid science that didn't even exist then. <laughs> it was ahead of the game. And one of the things I would like to just kind of interject with is this very mental chiropractic philosophy is the body needs nothing extra in it. It simply needs no interference. Right. We want to talk about the energy field. Now we're sure. talking about why chiropractic is so effective as a healing art, because yeah. it doesn't add anything in or remove anything. It just removes interference from the, the physiology and yeah. the physiology gives the momentum to what you said earlier, the nervous system. And when the nervous system is in harmony within the environment, then the outside in sickness doesn't yeah. invade and kill. It, it invades and it becomes used and it becomes something that's more uh, effective for the genetic expression of survival. And that's why what you're talking about with this dynamics of human expression and with the dynamics of science and with the dynamics of bio biology, it all goes back to the human expression of removing the subluxation. When you remove the subluxation, the body is able to live in harmony within the environment that's created, and then it can fight off anything that invades it because it is a true form of healing. And healing is from within. Like they always say, the number one doctor is the one within the body. It's not the one that's going to prescribe something to you. Well, let, let, let me give you a fact that this, so it starts off with this fact, you ready? Less than 1% of disease is connected to genes. Less than 1%. I go, then where the hell is all the disease coming from? 90% is coming from stress and lifestyle. I go, so why is that relevant? Because those are controllable by you without drugs and chemistry and operations. And you don't need that. I go, so what do you want to do? You, you want to bring the energy into harmony. Mm -hmm. I say, well, what does that mean? I say, what is energy? Well, you can't see it. It's invisible. But I can tell you what it would physically look like. And that is drop a rock into a pond. And when you drop it into the pond, the energy from the falling rock is translated into the water as a force. And that force is what shapes ripples. So the energy is a force that has a wave to it. That's why the ripples form, okay? So I go, the higher the amplitude of the wave, okay, uh, the, the, the more powerful that energy. In other words, you throw a pebble into the pond, you get a little tiny wave. You throw a rock into the pond, you get a big wave. What is it? The amount of energy is the determining factor of the height of the wave. So I go, okay. I say, what does that mean? I say, life is energy. Well, we've always been saying that all the time. No energy, no life. That's a fact. Well, now it becomes a little more important because life and the universe and everything is energy. I go, so I say, where's your energy level? I say, if you have a very flat energy level, you have a very flat life. I go, so what causes this flat energy level? I say, interference 
of energies that are not supporting you. you go interference. I go, okay, wait, now we come back. I say, I dropped a rock in the pond. I made ripples and it radiated out. I say, what if I drop two rocks in the pond at the same time and the ripples start coming toward each other when the energy interacts and they're in harmony. And this, this is the point I'm going to try to make. So we visualize a picture. I drop two rocks, exactly the same size mass from the exact same height. Oop, let's, okay, they're exact same height. And I drop them at exactly the same time that the ripples that result are exactly the same. They're in harmony. They're both going up. They're both going down. They're both going up. And I say, what happens when those ripples meet each other? And the answer is, when two energies come together, you add up the values of the waves. So I say, well, what if both waves go up, one down, one, one up, one down? I say, what happens when they come together? I go, well, one plus one is two. All of a sudden I say, oh, so the normal ripple was this high, but the combined ripple is this high because you combine the energy of two of them. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. So two energies in harmony add up together. Let me give you a scientific name, so it's not all baloney here. A <laughs> scientific name is, is simply this. It's called interference, wave A, interfering with wave B, but it's called constructive interference. I said, what does that mean? It means that when two waves come together and they add up and make more powerful energy, that's a construction, okay? And I say, the vibes are rep recognizes this. I say, so what does it represent? Constructive interference means good vibes. What does that mean? You got more energy. You're around somebody who has the same energy as you, the two ripples of you and them come together. Good vibes. You get excited. You're around them. Okay. Now here's a little slightly different story. The other extreme. Two rocks. I drop one first. Then I drop the other. I go, what's the difference? Well, this ripple is going up. This ripple is going down. Okay. So I say, and as this one is going down, this one is going up. I said, wait, they're out of phase. They're not in phase. When one's at the bottom, the other's at the top. <laughs> and then they switch. Okay? Well, they're interfering. But is it called constructive? And the answer is, well, remember, the value is add up the value of the waves. So I said they went up one. They went down one. So it's plus one, minus one. Okay? So a wave is plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. Okay? I said, what if... Two waves out of phase come together. I say, well, one wave is that plus one. The other wave is that minus one. I say, you still add up the values of the energy. Plus one, minus one, zero. It's interference. Is it constructive? <laughs> it's called destructive interference. Two energies can come together and cancel each other out if they're not in harmony. We also refer to it as bad vibes. <laughs> and I say, why is it relevant? Because vibration is the language of all organisms, including humans. Only humans have developed really verbal language. A snail communicates with other things. There's no language. How does it communicate? Vibration. Every organism communicates by vibration. I say, so why is it relevant? Well, if we stop using thinking and just read vibration and someone comes into your field, you're going to either feel more energy because they're in your field, good vibes, are you going to feel less energy, bad vibes? I go, that is what all organisms use as a compass to read where they should be in life. Always go for high energy. A patient comes in with low vibration. Why do they come into your office? You're a healer. I say, well, yeah, but what are you going to heal? Chemicals? I Screw the chemicals. No, I'm going to add vibration. I say, well, so what's important? That's what we talked about. If the vibration of the healer is high, then interference, when the patient comes in and interferes, guess what? It causes the patient to experience constructive interference, good vibes, enhanced health. And all of a sudden you go, oh, this is all physics. I go, it's 100% physics. That's all there is, is physics. And I go, so why is it relevant? And it still comes back to the fact do I need to put my hands in your system to fix your biology? I go, very rarely, very rarely. That the healing is starting because consciousness, article in journal nature, consciousness and spirit, mind and spirit are creating this. And they're energy sources, not chemical, physical sources. They cause the release of chemistry. That's down the cascade. 
but they're the start of the cascade. So I say, so the significance is, do I, if I come in with a problem, do I need to open you up and mess with your chemistry and adjust all these things? Well, reductionistic biology shows, yes, everything's a cascade. This causes this, this causes that, this causes that, this. And then you say, well, I'll fix this piece, or I'll fix this piece. I go, you're fixing down line, man. <laughs> the problem didn't start down line. The problem started up here. And I say, yeah, but up here gets the down line. How? Nervous system. Interfere with that nervous system? You lost the communication. When you start breaking down the communication, the vitality of the system falters. That's when it starts to show symptoms of not being in harmony. And I say, so what's the difference between a vitalistic and a mechanistic chiropractor? Okay, little story, little side story. I take a piece of iron and a file and I file it down, make a pile of what is called iron filings, iron dust, okay? I put the iron filings in a salt shaker. And then I sprinkle it on a piece of paper. I get a, a random pile of iron filings. Every time I do it, I get a random pile of iron filings. And then I go, well, wait. This time I put a magnet underneath that piece of paper. Now when I sprinkle the iron filings, it's not a random pile anymore. Now they form that very ornate structure of the magnetic field. I go, ah, so here's the point. Matter without field, no pattern. Matter in a field pattern, okay? So I say, well, what if uh, I come in and my physical body, the equivalent of the iron filings, the iron filings could be cancer. <laughs> That's another one. I say, what caused the cancer? And you would say the iron filings, the cells in the, I say, no, the cells didn't cause the cancer. The field caused the cancer. That goes back to the Einstein quote. The field is the sole governing agency of the particle. And I go, so when you sprinkle the iron filings, the distribution of the filings is not based on the filings, it's based on the field. So let's say now I come in with a subluxated pattern and I go to a mechanical chiropractor. What are they going to try to do? Push the iron filings around, make that field come back. I go, temporarily, that's a really cool move because temporarily, all of a sudden, that person will be responding to a better field. But the filings are controlled by the field. So even if you push them into a new organization in a short time, they'll come back to the original field again. And that's why the patient keeps coming back for the same damn adjustment. The adjustment worked, but you only pushed the filings around. You didn't change the field. And as a result, you have to keep resetting the iron filings. The mechanical chiropractor has to have the patient keep coming back, push the iron filings back in. Patient walks away, doc, thanks, I feel really good. And then in a very short time, the iron filings go back to the field and they're back in the subluxated state. I say, what about vitalistic chiropractors? Oh, no. They're not so interested in pushing the iron filings around. Vitalist energy, changing the energy of the field. And then all of a sudden, the pattern becomes stable. If you push the iron filings, the filings are not stable. They'll come back to the field. If you change the field, then the new form of the iron filings is now stable. So that is the primary difference between a vitalistic and a mechanistic chiropractor. Both work. But the mechanistic one has a much shorter span of effectiveness than a vitalist who changes a field. Because that now creates a new distribution of those iron filings without you pushing them around. That is... so. That's, I got called into from Stanford to Life West, gave the lecture, and all of a sudden realized, vitalistic chiropractic, that's my audience. <laughs> Why? <laughs> they are already predisposed to recognizing the role of energy, which is fundamental to the basic science of the universe, quantum physics. Mechanical chiropractic, that's um, allopathic, reductionistic mechanism uh, and effective short term, but not really effective for long term. So, so where, where do you see pharmacology and the practice of medicine going in the next 10, 10 years, years or so? And how <laughs> do you see chiropractic changing? Well, the idea is this. Pharmacology is a reductionistic approach from conventional allopathic medicine. It says there's a pathway, it's not working right. If I put some chemicals in there, I can adjust the pathway. 
I go, you never heal the damn thing. And then the side effects of the chemicals are worse than the effect of the chemicals and, you know, generally. And I go, so what's the use of it? I say, you built a science of healing on putting in chemicals? The system isn't designed on chemicals. It's designed on energy. You've, this is why 300,000 people die from prescription drugs in the USA. I go, wow, 300,000 people. I go, you know, they have a war on illegal drugs. 30, 40,000 people die from illegal drugs. You got a war on illegal drugs. 300,000 people die from prescription drugs. It's like, oh, that's the cost of doing medicine. That's what they say. I go, wow, that's a hell of an expensive cost to do allopathic medicine. Pharmaceutical company is not here to help us. That's like the friendly banker idea. A banker is only friendly if you don't need them. <laughs> you know, you got a lot of money. They're your friends. You go in there because you want money. They're not your friends. Okay. Pharmaceutical company is not your friend. Pharmaceutical company is a corporation whose business is to make money at the expense of who? The patient. And all those side effects. Side effects is a euphemism because <laughs> the truth is they're called direct effects. A drug has direct effects. The side effects are, that was because they intended the drug to do this, but this is how those things happened, and that's not our intention, so that was a side effect. <laughs> that's not a side effect. That's a direct effect from taking a damn drug. Statins. Holy crap. Statins. Out of 100 people that take that drug, three people will have a positive effect. So 97% of the people that take statin have no positive effect from that drug. Only the most extreme people that are closest to heart attack will have an effect from a statin. 97% of people have no positive effect. But, are you ready? But I think it's 25 to 28% of people taking statins have very negative side effects. So it helps three people and hurts 25 to 28 people. <laughs> it's like, do they care? Hell no. They're just going to try and get more people to take statins because every time they lower the value of cholesterol, that it's got to be a little bit lower. That's another million more prescriptions. Ha! Every 10 years, it's like, oh, that cholesterol level is too high. We should make it here. Oh, guess what? You're, now your cholesterol level was high. Last week, it wasn't. This week, it is. Now you need statin. <laughs> it's a destructive drug. And yet they market this like it's going to help people. And so many people buy it. And the only positive effect you can get from a statin, if you're not one of those three people, is because you believe it's going to make an effect, and that's called placebo. But itself, the statin drug is, is a toxic thing. I wouldn't even put anything like that in my system. The whole story is completely BS. That's belief system. Uh, and, uh, and it's time for a change. And, and what's most important, you know what it's interesting? Because I started teaching chiropractors back in like 1991 and 92. And it was always funny to find them feeling like they were second-class citizens because they were alibis and then they were chiropractors. And I go, you got the whole damn thing upside down. You want healing, go to the chiropractor. You want side effects, you, you, you can go to the allopaths if you want to do that. And yet what the whole idea is, a consciousness. I go, so why is it relevant? Well, if you start as a chiropractor because I wanted to go to medical school, didn't get in, so I'll do chiropractic, you already created second-class consciousness. It's like, that's stupid. When chiropractic is a much more physical and, and, and biological and energetic way of healing than allopathic medicine. And so... Um, I try the best I can to empower chiropractors, especially vitals, vitalists, because that is the most effective way of healing a body. Do not go under the skin. We don't have enough intelligence to deal with the higher intelligence that creates us. And so to me, I left the allopathic community right after that, uh, joined the chiropractic community as, hey, you guys are doing right, so let me encourage you. <laughs> it was a lot easier than going in and saying, hey, you guys are doing wrong, let me fix you. Uh, hell with that. I'll just Let's start working with one that works, vitalistic chiropractic. Well, our good well, friend, friend Michelle Moss says, 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 I am so, I am so blessed to have taken class with you as a student for CE at Life West. Um, what I have learned from you is what I teach every day in my practice. Thank you. 
And I think that that's a direct correlation to your steadfastness with uh, empowering people with uh, the proper programming of education. Yes. Because people think that education is in a book. So many people think that education is in a classroom, but education is what you are actually able to emanate to somebody and why somebody can say, this is a devotion I have to you is to say this back to you. So I think that that's where we're at right now with this conversation is where I want to take you next is maybe share with our audience some of who some of your heroes might be and how you've come up with the the path of um, your journey on life right now that you're on. And uh, maybe some uh, someone that if you could take anybody from the history of time <laughs> and, sit and have coffee with for an hour, who would that be? Albert Einstein, <laughs> he had it, he saw it, he created, he brought it down to reality. He talked about all those important things such as uh, uh, as the energy is the shaper of, of the realm we see as matter, which is an illusion. Uh, and, and he understood the nature of spirituality. He understood the nature of consciousness. And he put all this together. He was so spot on, you know. And then for our local audience, I would go back and say D.D. D. Palmer. Man, he saw it. He he understood it. There was no science book that said anything that he was saying. It was early at that time. Somebody had to start, <laughs> you know. And Dee Dee, as I said, he was the one of the two. BJ made chiropractic accessible to the public by taking the spiritual healing, the woo-woo, out. But at the compromise of lessening the value of the energy, which is that was the I would, that's a compromise. I, I go back to D.D. D. Palmer. Uh, um, currently, you know, my, my dear friends include, uh, well, Guy Reekman, for example, uh, Brian Kelly, um, um, just a, a wonderful uh, array of vitalistic chiropractors that said, I am following my truth, irregardless of what conventional people are saying. Because they already knew that this this vitalistic chiropractic was exactly what is necessary to help people. Now, chiropractic doesn't do surgery. <laughs> of medicine, the only real thing that medicine has done is surgery. Okay, and I go, well, why? Why is that? Well, if I you know break my leg or you know uh, get in a car accident, I'm cutting a, a cut open and stuff like that. A chiropractic is nice, but it's not going to really help me where I need a physical mechanic to fix a physical machine at that point. But the operation of the machine, here's an interesting fact. When a vehicle comes out of the factory, 90 some percent, 99% of those vehicles came out, tested, working, everything cool. And then I say, yeah, but then they end up in a, in a junkyard. Did they end up in a junkyard because of vehicle failure or driver error? The answer is very small number of vehicle failure, almost always driver error. I go, this is exactly true with biology and health. Driver, vehicle, point. You got good driver education. Vehicle's going to last you a long time. It's going to run well. It's going to be taken care of. You get annual servicing, takes care of it, and all that, okay? You have bad driver training. I'm a victim. I'll take pharmaceutical drugs and all that. Your vehicle is going to be in the junkyard long before anybody else's vehicle. And so the idea is very simply this, is that chiropractic is essential to understanding and could even be a little bit more effective if it was truly emphasized that there are ways to change that consciousness. It's not psychology, but well, it's actually called energy psychology, but it's not like cognitive psychology where I got to go back and find out who did what to me to make me the way I am. Uh, I just want to cancel that idea. That is the worst thing you could ever do because that makes you go back to the original problem, relive the problem with so and so who did this to me. Now you're just, oh, you're pushing the button and playing the program again. I go, there's an old saying, don't kill the messenger over the message. That means the messenger isn't the problem. He just gave you the message. So I say, the people that have interacted with us during those developmental years where we started to learn programs, those are messengers. What did you walk away? You didn't walk away with them. You walked away with a message. To go back and blame those people, that's irre it's irrelevant. You don't even have to go back. That's even the better part. Your life, 
95% of your life is coming from the subconscious programs. Your life is a printout of your programs. I say, because you don't know the damn programs. I say, yeah, because you know what? You were being programmed before you were born, the last trimester of pregnancy. You were programmed a whole year when you were zero. You were programmed a whole year when you were one. You were programmed a whole year when you were two, three. Now, you might at some point start to catch some recognition, four, three, four, five. But guess what? The basic programs that went in before three, you have no awareness of. Really, you weren't there. There was no consciousness. You have no idea. I say, how do you know what your programs are? And I go back. That's what I was saying. 95% of your life is coming from your programs. Your life is a printout of your programs. All you have to do is look at your life and go, the things that come in that you like, they come in because you have a program to encourage them. But, and here's the one I want people to pay attention to. When you are trying to seek the things you want and you have to struggle, work hard, sweat over it, put a lot of effort in, I'm going to make this happen. Why are you struggling? The answer is, fundamentally, your program doesn't support that. <laughs> and you're going to try and use your conscious mind, the creative one, I'm going to work on it, I'm going to put effort on it, I'm going to do all that, to override a program that's running 95% of the day. And, uh, and so it really becomes incumbent upon us to understand, so what are my programs? I said, look at your life, wherever you're struggling, it's not the universe is stopping you from having that. You're struggling because your own program doesn't let you go there. Amen. So basically, do I need to see a psychologist and review my history? I say, no, you don't. You are living your program right now. Regardless of when you learned it, it's right now. So going back to say, this is how I learned it, I go, well, that just oh, no, you're just replaying the same damn trauma you got the first time. You don't need to go back. You are your program, and that makes life easier because basically it says, so look at your life right now and say, what, the things that you struggle with, it's not because the universe won't give it to you. You need to really go back and affect change in your program, and then things will manifest for you. So what does it mean for you to be in films like The Secret and to have such a massive YouTube following? What's that like? Well... The, the first thing, at least it offers me an audience that will listen to some of the stuff I'm talking about. I'm not solely into the whole secret. The whole secret is, hey, I wanted a million. I only made $40. You know, it's like, oh, I'm going to make a million. I say that. First of all, people have misunderstood the nature of the joy of life because they generally connect it to the material expression. When I get that new Maserati, I'm going to be the happiest guy in the world. I go, you can be happy without a Maserati. <laughs> and all of a sudden I say, it's that emotion, the happiness, the joy, the gratitude of being alive. This is what enhances our vitality. But when you wake up going, oh God, I got to face this. And oh man, this isn't going to work. And I said, why do you want to even go outside your house? And all of a sudden your biology is saying, nope, let's don't go outside. Let's die. <laughs> And in fact, longevity is totally based on uh, your satisfaction with life. Uh, and this has a direct connection with something called telomeres, which are extensions of the chromosome. Uh, and telomeres are a character uh, of the chromosomes that determine longevity. So telomeres are like the fountain of youth that you have built into you. Uh, and I don't know, let's see how much time we got. Ooh, we're over a little bit, but I could, should I talk about telomeres or just leave it at that? You guys tell me. I think we have a couple more questions. Um, I would like to just uh, thank you for being our guest today, but I would also like to uh, know that there's a lot of stuff that we didn't get a chance to discuss with you today. So maybe we could get a round two of Bruce Lipton on the Cairo Hustle hey, podcast in the future. You guys are my advocates out there in the world of chiropractic. I'm with you. Cool, cool, cool. Well, I, I know we have two more questions that we'd like to ask before we jump yeah. off with you today. Yeah. How did you scale so quickly in your career? What was the catalyst for your success? <laughs> you mean the, vision, the original success with the culture cells or the post-success with changing my life? Which one? Good, good question. <laughs> well, if, I, if, I can add, if I can give some clarity to the question. Yeah, please. Um, from the point that you got into the chiropractic space to where you are today with such the following that you have. Yeah. 
How did I get there? Yeah, what was the catalyst behind I it? I awoke <laughs> to the fact that the disharmony in my life was not coming from the outside. The disharmony was coming from my programming as a child and the life experiences that those programs led to. And then at first, that's when I started to recognize, wait, my consciousness is creating this. I still had all these programs that were interfering with me. But then I started to learn uh, there are three ways to change this consciousness only, the subconscious. And I go, why, why is it unique? The creative conscious mind, by definition, is creative. The conscious mind is creative. I, I can go watch a video, listen to this lecture, uh, read a book. I can go, aha, and I just change conscious mind. It's creative. Subconscious mind is called the habit mind because those are habits, programs. You push the button, play the program, okay? Uh, we, we generally give a very negative attitude toward the subconscious. I go, no, that, boy, that subconscious is a brilliant device. For what reason? I say, well, hey, listen, guys, wh wh when, did, when did you learn how to walk? Oh, before you were two. Are you still walking? Oh, that's a program. Oh, you could be 100 and you're still walking? Yeah, because it was a program. So there are very good programs on managing our lives, but then there are programs that we get that don't enhance our vitality, but take away some. Those are the negative programs, okay? So I say, well, yeah, but how do I know the negative programs? Well, we just mentioned, look at your life. It's a printout. And I say, well, you want to change those programs? I go, ah, that's where the problem has always come from because there's always this belief. Well, now that I become consciously aware of it, of course, my life is going to change. I read that self-help book. You know, boy, I'm going to be different now. I go, your life didn't change after you read the self-help book. You became more knowledgeable, but that knowledge did not become part of your life. If you took a quiz, that knowledge would be useful and you would pass it. But did that knowledge change your behavior? Mm -mm. No, because that's not how the subconscious learns. Ah, it learns in a different way. That is why there's a disconnect between our wishes and desires and our ability to change our life. Wishes and desires, creative conscious mind. Subconscious mind's habit mind. First word, habit. I say, why is it relevant? If that mind would change, just like changing, it wouldn't be a habit anymore. It, it, you know, a habit is, I've got a program. I do not want it to change. I learned how to walk. I don't need to change this habit. <laughs> I don't want anything to change this habit. I'm doing really good with it. So a habit's going to last me for as long as I live. Okay. So I say, yeah, but then a habit mind resists change. I go, yes. And that's where the problem comes from. Because I'm going to say, okay, here's a failure of most people. Conscious mind. I could have a better way of life if I do this. So conscious mind's going, come on, Bruce, you can do better than this. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? You can do better. And then it doesn't seem to work. And I go, why not? <laughs> and then the first question is, who are you talking to? I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to my subconscious. I go, aha, there's your problem. There's nobody in the subconscious. It's like a hard drive in a computer. You want to change your program in a computer? Go ahead and talk to it for a while. And tell me when the damn thing changes. It's not going to change a program. I say, oh, you want to change a program? Then there's a way to get access to the program. I say, well, how is that? And I said, the first two fundamental ways are the ways we got the damn programs. First program we got for seven years was because our brain was operating at a EEG, electroencephalograph vibration, lower than consciousness. It's called theta. Theta is characterized as imagination. Children up to age seven are primarily in theta. They can have an imaginary world mixed with a real world, a tea party. Let's pour nothing into the cup, drink the nothing, and exclaim how wonderful the tea was you just had. Theta, imagination. But theta is hypnosis. I say, so why is it relevant? I said, how do you think you learned the thousands of rules to be a member of a family and a community? You never read a book on it. And there are thousands of rules. I say, how'd you learn them? And the answer is in theta, I just observed other people. That's a state of hypnosis. I downloaded their behavior. It becomes my program. So the first seven years, your mind is open to download by like a video camera, observing your world, downloading what you see. That's where the programs come from. I say, yeah, that happens up to seven, but I still learn things after seven. I learned how to drive a car. I learned how to play an instrument. I learned how to do this. I go, and they become habits. 
driving a car, once you know how to drive a car, you don't have to think about it. You never do. In fact, once you learn how to drive a car, you put the key in the ignition and you're thinking about where you're going, what you're going to do and all this stuff. And not like the day one when you got in that car when it's like <gasps> window, mirrors, pedals, engine sound, all these things. <gasps> okay, that was consciousness. Now you learn how to do it. You, you you can drive the car with, you know, most of the time you drive the car with no consciousness. Subconscious is what you drive the car with. So I go, okay, so how did I learn that? Because I wasn't in hypnosis. I go, no, you learned it by repetition. That's what creates a habit. You repeat something and repeat something and repeat it like a religious expression. you got to repeat it and repeat it. Practice it, practice it, practice. That's how you learn how to play an instrument. That's how you learn how to drive the car. You had to practice. So it's not just like, oh, I have a great idea. I think I'll make change. I go, that's nice. I'm not going to change a damn thing with that. I didn't change anything. I like the new agey. The new agey thing is called fake it till you make it. <laughs> I say, what does that mean? I say, you are an unhappy, miserable person. You don't want to be this way. So you want to be happy. I say, oh, then all day long, repetition, you say to yourself, I am happy. I'm in spite of whatever crap is going on. I am happy. I am happy. I am happy. Repetition. There'll be a day where you wake up and guess what? You wouldn't even have to say I'm happy. The program once installed requires no more effort. That's the beautiful part. It's only the beginning effort. Once the program is in, zero effort because the program runs 95% of the day anyway. So the idea is, so the first two ways of doing it is hypnosis. Second way is repetition. And the third is a new way called energy psychology which is a way of engaging super learning. Super learning. I say, maybe you've seen somebody read a book, they take their finger and move it down the page, just like that. Just as fast as I move that finger down, the, I would read all of the printed text on that page, just going like that. That's called super learning. A person that can do this can go into a bookstore, open up a book, read it in five minutes, put the book back on the shelf. I go, but if you can engage super learning, then you can increase the download capability. And so there are a variety of uh, modalities called energy psychology, which open up a super learning character so you can download a new program, not in days or weeks, but in minutes. And this is necessary at this time because human behavior programming is causing our mass extinction, which we talked about in the very beginning. And if we want to survive, we have to change our consciousness and so necessity being the mother of invention offered, hey, here's a new way to change consciousness. Do it in minutes. <laughs> uh, and this is really vital to us right now. And you don't have to be a psychologist. It's not psychiatry. Because remember, it's not going back. It's looking at you right here, right now. What is your issue? What do you want to change? It didn't say who caused what, why it happened, when it happened. It's irrelevant. So is it violating chiropractic to do energy psychology? You go, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, that is the most effective way of healing, doing two things, doing an adjustment and energy healing. Why? Because then they won't keep going back into the old program, the old form again. And you go, yeah, but then maybe they won't need so many adjustments. I go, yeah, that's true. But guess what? <laughs> You'll be so damn successful that they will send people, you'll have people lined up outside your door because when you start to show people how effective they can change, they're going to tell everybody else, well, I used to be this way, but I went to this chiropractor and look at me now. <laughs> and that, my friend Bruce, is why they call it a healing art. Yeah, and that's why they call it medical practice. They're still practicing. They haven't got it down yet. <laughs> So I, I don't, don't, call don't medical, do medical practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Bruce Lipton, it has been an honor, but we have reached the edge of our time for today. We I will love to come back two. and talk with you. You guys are wonderful. You're doing a great service. And all of those people out there in this community right now, I honor every one of you for this. All of you are, are leaders in a field that you didn't even know you were doing it. You are changing healthcare. Healthcare is not invasive. It's facilitated. 
And the significance of this wonderful audience that we have is you make a difference in this world. And no pharmaceutical drugs, folks. No drugs, no injections, none of that crap. Because there are more powerful ways, and chiropractic is one of the more powerful ways of changing an individual's life without interfering with the mechanism. And that is one of the most important directions healing must, must go into. Don't mess with this mechanism. It's a, an adjustment of the running of this mechanism. Well, I honor you for your time today, and thank you for being our guest on the Cairo Hustle Podcast, episode 227. If people want to know more about you and your programs, where can we send them to a possible website or very any simple resources? Jim, Luke, again, thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to this amazing audience, okay? And if you really want uh, to get some information I'm talking about, my website is straightforward, brucelipton.com. And there are articles and videos and audios and blah, 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 free download to get you into this new insight. Great. Thank you so much for being our guest today. And we will book you for episode two very soon. I would love to be back with you guys. So thank you. And again, special thanks to our audience, the people that are making a difference in this world. Thank you all. Thank you, Bruce. Talk soon, my friend. Thanks for listening to Cairo Hustle. Don't forget to subscribe and check back next week to continue hustling.